We'll visit with them. Uh, let's pray. Oh God, it's certainly a beautiful scene that we have just witnessed where people have responded to the call and have gone to the front lines in order for us to be able to sit here today and enjoy the wonderful, wonderful blessings that we have in America. Lord, we know that peace is a very fragile thing. And there are countries around us who detest what it is that we represent and will do anything. And so thus, we have people always on the alert, always with their bags packed, ready to go when needed. Lord, we just thank you for the sacrifice that these dear people have made for us. How it is that they have gone and they've seen the high price that is needed to be paid. And they said, we will go and pay that price. Reminds us a bit of Calvary. When we think of our Lord going to the cross and paying the ultimate price of freedom and the permanent freedom that we have in him. And so we thank you and we thank you and we thank you for this beautiful opportunity of seeing and having these people before us as great, great servants of yours. Lord, we know in the midst of all of this, we stand and sit in America. In this season, after the election, I would pray that peace would settle on those who feel discouraged and humility on those who celebrate. May our federal, state, and local leaders, whether newly elected or returning to office, be guided by integrity, righteousness, and a desire to serve as one who is in authority as God's servant. Grant to them wisdom and discernment that they may govern with justice and righteousness, guide their decisions and actions so they may lead with humility, care, and an understanding that God alone has established their authority. Father, bless our land with peace, harmony, and spiritual renewal. Strengthen our communities. Heal the wounds of conflict and inspire us to serve one another with Christian love and kindness. Psalm 72, 3. May the mountains bring prosperity to the people, the hills the fruit of righteousness. We humbly ask for your divine blessing on every person, every family, every institution, knowing that blessing only comes when we humble ourselves, pray, seek your face, and turn from our wicked ways. In addition to our prayer this morning, we want to remember our two teams who have gone to North Carolina and to Florida. And just hearing today from a dear couple in our church of their family being touched by these storms just brings back a sense of, wow, and this, these teams have gone and responded and have tried to fulfill the things that you would have for them. Lord, they not only work with their hands, but they work with your hands, and that is just so, so special. And Lord, we thank you for our church. We know that there are some who are here who are being blessed upon being blessed, and we're so thankful for them. And we know that there are some who are struggling. The storms of life have sort of been a battle with them, 
And so we would just lift them up as well. We know there are some major decisions that are needed to be made. Oh, God, guide them in those decisions. And may they feel the confidence and the strength and the wisdom that only you can give to them. And then ultimately, Lord, we get to hear the word of God this morning. May we never take it lightly. May we never think it's just another Sunday. But today, as the word of God is open to us, we are able to not only read the word of God, but we can have the word of God taught to us. I'm just so grateful for this staff and Pastor Mike and the ability through your spirit that they have in communicating in your word. This we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Our passage of scripture this morning is a very unique passage of scripture. And it's going to be one that is going to unfold our beginning statements of I am. And as we think of this passage of scripture, it is so special because there's people that do not understand and thus, we find this passage before us as Jesus attempts to explain. The Jews answered him, Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? I am not possessed by a demon, Jesus said, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself. But there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Very truly, I say to you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. At this, they exclaim, now we know that you are demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet 50 years older, they said to him, and you have seen Abraham? Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to throw and to stone him. But Jesus hid himself slipping away from the temple grounds. Thank you, Pastor Kyle. I want to begin with a question this morning that will get you engaged in thinking about where you land on a continuum of 1 to 10. So, on a scale of 1 to 10, how well do you know Jesus? How well do you know Jesus? If 1 is not well... And 10 is, I know everything there is to know about Jesus. Where do you land on that scale? How well do you know him? Whatever we know about Jesus, whatever knowledge we have, I, I'm going to go out on a limb. It's not much of a limb, however, and say that every one of us need to know more. We need to know him better. We need to have a deeper understanding of who he is. We need to embrace the truth about him, and we need to allow that truth to change our lives. And that's exactly where we're going for the next eight weeks in our worship times here at Grace Community. We're going to take what we know about Jesus, and we're going to take it to the next level. What we're going to do is we're going to dive deep into what Jesus says about himself in the I am sayings of Jesus in the Gospel of John. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life, the vine, the resurrection and the life, the gate, the good shepherd, the light of the world. Every one of these I am declarations of Jesus, every one of them 
is intended to be a declaration by him of who he is. But more than that, it is intended to have personal implications for who we are, to make a life-changing difference in who we are and how we live in the world around us. Today, we're going to begin with a foundational sermon. And that foundational sermon is going to unpack the truth of the threatening nature of Jesus Christ. The threatening nature of Jesus Christ. Now, I suspect that very few people have ever used the word Jesus and threat in the same sentence. Because it's like, really, do they go together? Is Jesus a threat? If you look up definition of threat, it means danger. Is Jesus a danger? And I would contend this morning that indeed Jesus is indeed a threat. We've just come through the election. We've had two campaigns vying for the election of their candidate. We were told over many months that if he is elected or she is elected, either one of them will be a threat to our way of life. And I want you to understand this morning that the greatest threat to our way of life is not a political candidate, not a leader of a government. The greatest threat to our way of life is Jesus Christ. And as we unpack the scriptures this morning, I believe that you'll see that truth, that, that Jesus is a threat to our way of living. Now, we already know that he is a major threat to the way of life in over 50 nations around the world. North Korea, Somalia, Iran, Afghanistan, Eritrea, Sudan, 37 other nations, all of them on the world watch list because of their persecution of men and women who claim Jesus as Savior and Lord. In every one of those nations, the leaders of the nations are threatened by Jesus because he threatens their dictatorial control of their people. And yet, they are not the first to be threatened by Jesus. The very first to be threatened by Jesus, you heard them in today's text. They are the leaders of the Jewish people, comprised of Pharisees, teachers of the law, leaders of Jewish culture and religion. These are men who were threatened to the very core of their being by Jesus Christ. If you have time, I invite you to read all of John chapter 8. And what you'll learn is that in the first 47 verses of John 8, seven times they challenged Jesus. Threatened by him, they retorted back and they challenged him. Because you see, these Jewish leaders desperately wanted to trap Jesus. They wanted to trap him and, and get him to say something that would be ultimately blasphemous and that they could charge him with that blasphemy and they could rid him from the scene. But Jesus would have none of it. Jesus confused them. He frustrated them. He irritated them. He even turned the tables on them at one point in John chapter 8 when they brought a woman caught in adultery and they thrust her in front of him and they wanted to know whether he was going to judge her and punish her. We should stone her. And Jesus did not contradict stoning. This is what he said. If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And he presented to them a biblical truth that is true today as it was then. Stone throwers must be sinless. Say that with me. Stone throwers must be sinless. Say it again. Stone throwers must be sinless. Go ahead. Go ahead. Throw a stone if you want. The only condition, the only qualification, true then, true now, that if you're going to judge someone and throw a stone, you simply have to be sinless. And there was only one who qualified to throw that stone, and his name was? And did you notice he didn't pick up a stone? He didn't throw one in her direction or anyone else's direction at all. In their hot anger, the leaders of the Jews did what immature people do when they don't get their way. They go for the jugular. And so what do they do? Embarrassed by Jesus, angry with him, infuriated by the way in which he answers all of their challenges, they attack his character, and they make every effort to destroy his good reputation 
so that the adoring crowds would adore no longer. Look at verse 48. Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? And those are fighting words. To call someone a Samaritan, if you were a Jew, is to call them a half-breed. Another word that they used was dog. You're a dog. You're no good. You have no place in our society or culture. And if that isn't bad enough, you're not only a half-breed, but you're also demon-possessed. And that is exactly what it says it is. You are possessed by the devil himself. They went for the jugular. They wanted to tear down his reputation. Why? Because he was a threat. But Jesus, Jesus answers them, and he does so calmly. Listen again to verses 49 through 51. I am not possessed by a demon, but I know and honor my father, and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. I tell you the truth. If a man keeps my word, he will never see death. John 8, 52 and 53. At this, the Jews exclaimed, now we know that you're demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say that if a man keeps your word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Perfect question. Great question to ask Jesus. Jesus, who do you think you are? And Jesus begins to oblige with an answer. See, the Jewish leaders refuse to consider what Jesus is saying. They argue instead that Jesus has no right to claim victory over death. After all, even Abraham, the great father of the Jewish nation, died. And so did all of our prophets. They're dead. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Micah, Joel, Amos, Malachi, they're all dead. They're in their graves. Who are you? Are you greater than Abraham? Are you greater than the prophets? Who exactly do you think you are? And yet again, Jesus answers calmly. This time he explains his relationship to the Father, and he notes that unlike the Jewish leaders, he knows the Father in heaven, and he obeys him. John eight fifty five. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said... I did not, I would be a liar just like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. And then Jesus said something absolutely startling to the Jewish ears. John 8, 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced as he looked forward to my coming. He saw it and was glad. 2,000 years ago, your father Abraham the one whom you tout as the founder of the chosen people of God. He knew all about me. He saw that I was going to come. He knew that there would be a Messiah, a Savior. Oh, and by the way, when I was born in that manger in Bethlehem, he saw. He saw my birth. <laughs> and he was glad. He rejoiced. He celebrated. By now, the Jewish leaders are frustrated, they are confused, and they are angry. They are seething. Who do you think you are? You're not even 50. How many of you would like to hear somebody say that to you right now? <laughs> You're not even 50. What does that mean? Why'd they pull the birthday card? Because if you're going to be an elder and know it all, you've got to be at least 50. You're not even 50. You're not even old enough to know the things that you claim you know about Abraham and the prophets, that you've seen him and that he has seen you. But Jesus isn't affected at all by their anger. He goes on and he makes this astonishing statement in John 8, 58. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was even born, I am. I want you to read that simple statement with me, beginning at I tell you. I tell you the truth, 
Before Abraham was even born, I am. Read it again and emphasize I am. I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was even born, I am. At this statement, the fury of the Jews raged out of control. Whatever they were trying to contain could be contained no longer. They were red-faced, I am sure. They were seething. Everything inside them was literally tied up in knots. How dare he suggest that he is greater than Abraham? How could he possibly be older? And how dare he say, I am? Those are fighting words. Those are words of blasphemy. Those are words that are all that is necessary to get you out and off this scene, Jesus. You know what they did? They did what they didn't do early in John 8. They stooped over and reached for the stones. And they were ready to stone Jesus to death for these two words. Say them with me. I am. And the word of God says in John chapter 8, verse 59, Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds before the first stone was cast. It was these last two words, friends, that posed the greatest threat and stirred the most intense emotion among the Jewish leaders. I am. I am. How in the world could these two words prompt such a violent reaction? Let me tell you how, and let me tell you why. Because in saying, I am, Jesus was using a familiar name to make an astonishing claim. And every Jew that was present there knew exactly what Jesus was saying. You see, friends, I am is the name of God. It is the name of God. I am is part of the historical record of the nation of Israel. It holds a prominent place in the story of Moses and his leadership of Israel as they escaped out of Egypt. In Exodus chapter three, we're gonna unpack Exodus in the new year, but let's just kind of give you a teaser right now. In Exodus chapter three is one of the startling stories of the life of Moses. And man, it jumped off the page when I was a kid off a flannel graph, because how in the world does a bush burn and never get consumed? But there it was in bright orange and yellow tones in Bethel Church in Conestoga, a burning bush. And there was Moses standing next to a burning bush. And he heard the very voice of God telling him that God was prepared to deliver the people of God out of their suffering at the hand of Pharaoh. And that he, Moses, who stuttered and struggled with his own self-confidence, that he, Moses, would be the leader of the rescue effort. And do you know what Moses said? I love it. He, he looked at God in the burning bush and he said, well, who am I? Who am I to do that? And God said, I will be with you. And then Moses said to God, well, suppose I go to the Israelites and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you and they ask me, what is his name? Then what am I gonna tell them? And God said this to Moses. I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Friends, this story has been in the memory bank of every Jew from the time of their childhood. Every Jew that was present, every leader standing in front of Jesus 
in John chapter 8 knew this story. They knew the interaction, the dialogue between God and Moses out of the burning bush, and they knew God's name was I am. And so when Jesus said, I am, Jesus was saying, I am God. I am God. He, he wasn't just giving a, a, a story account of what Moses heard. He was saying, you know that story? You know that story about Moses in the burning bush? You know how God's name is I am? Guess what? I am. I am God. And the Jewish leaders were astounded. They were astonished. And they were infuriated. You know what that means? If Jesus is God, then his birth in Bethlehem was no ordinary birth. It must have been an incarnation. God must have become flesh and laid in a manger and been taken to Egypt and then up to Nazareth and raised in a home with an earthly mother and father, and yet he was God. If, if this is true, if Jesus is God, that means his words are no ordinary words. This is the word of God. He's a great teacher. He's spellbinding. And, but it's more than that. This is the very voice of God to us. And if Jesus is God, the way that he lived is no ordinary way to live. It is the one and only way to live. Later in John, Jesus would say something that to this day are fighting words in the culture and sadly, even in some churches. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He didn't say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Those who live in the following 22 countries will come to the Father by me. Those who live in Southeast Asia can use Buddhism and, and Shintoism to find me. Those who are in India can use Hinduism to find me. Those in the Middle East can use Islam to find me. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Say it with me. No one comes to the Father but by me. Friends, that is called the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. And it is the one doctrine that I believe is most under attack in the church of Jesus Christ the world over, but especially in the Western Hemisphere. The struggle to understand, to accept, to embrace the truth that there is only one Savior and Lord, and his name is Jesus. There is only one way of salvation, and it is his way. Friends, it is the reason that we at Grace Community Church and our sister churches all around us are passionate and urgent about sending missionaries to the ends of the world to share the good news of Jesus Christ, because he alone is Savior and Lord. Friends, herein lies the threat to surrender control and let Jesus be who he says he is. The idea for the Jewish leaders that, that if they wanted to be God-fearing people as they said they were, that they must surrender and follow Jesus was an idea they didn't want to entertain. But it's the truth. If you want to be saved... If you want your sins to be forgiven, if you want a new life, if you want to know that someday when you die, you'll live forever with Jesus in heaven, here's the truth. You need to trust Jesus Christ alone as Savior and Lord. No one comes to the Father but by him. And that requires that you surrender your life to him and follow him as Savior and Lord. In 45 days, no, I'm sorry, 44 days, in 44 days, we will have a celebration founded on an astonishing claim. Now, I know that some of you just now suddenly realize Christmas is coming in 44 days. Oh, my goodness. I, I whew. Stick with me. You have time. The internet, you can order all, you know, 24-7. No problem at all. In 44 days, we will have a celebration founded on an astonishing claim that the baby born in Bethlehem is no ordinary baby. 
The best expression of that truth is in John chapter one, verse 14. I invite you to read this with me. The word became flesh and lived for a while among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. There is absolutely no one who is like him. He is worthy of my surrender. He is the only one to whom I should give control of my life. Every word he speaks is the word of God. His will must be followed. He alone is Lord, and he is Lord of all. But to be honest with you, to be absolutely honest with you today, there are folks, some of whom you know, who don't want to hear that. That truth is threatening, not only to nations, not only to dictators of nations, but also to people that we know and love. You see, Jesus is a threat to our way of life. And as we carefully consider his claims, who he is and what he wants to do in our lives when we trust him, some people will consider him a threat. They don't want that change. They don't want that difference. And here's what it boils down to. They really don't want to lose control of their own lives. They don't want to give control to anyone else, and especially to Jesus. What do people do with Jesus if he is a threat to their way of life? What are the alternatives to surrendering your life to Jesus? Here are a couple of thoughts for you. Some people just hope that he will go away. Just go away. You know, out of thought, out of, and off the scene. Here's the problem with that thinking. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and he's not going anywhere. His claims need to be reckoned with. Some people choose to ignore him, at least for now. I can't even tell you how many times in my ministry I've heard people say, yeah, Mike, I, I know what you're saying, and I realize Jesus is a life changer. I'm not ready for that right now. I, I'm young. I got a life, lot of life to live. And so, you know, this is kind of like for old people. Like when I get older, I'll do something with Jesus, and then I'm in good shape for heaven and everything will be fine. Okay? The problem is that none of us know how many years we have on this earth. I, I want to gamble. I don't want to make that bet. Thirdly, there's a group of people who just want to make Jesus their co-pilot. Hey, come on, Jesus, you know. Join me here, you know. I'll drive this much, and then I'll let you drive a little bit. And, you know, if we have to parallel park, I'll let you do that because I'm not really good at that, you know. It's amazing. If I have to go through the city of Lancaster, I'll let Jesus drive me through the city. Otherwise, I'm going to drive through York and come back through Washington Bird to avoid the city. No, it's just... He's my co-pilot. He doesn't want to be your co-pilot. He's not favorable to co. He wants to be your pilot. Some people will reject him. The Jewish leaders in John 8 did. It's tragic. It's tragic. But here's where a lot of people fall. 
people who try to reduce Jesus to a less threatening person or position. And this happens a lot today. They try to reduce Jesus to a size that fits their life. So Jesus, here's the deal. I'd love to follow you and get the benefits that you talk about, but I'd like you to accept the following five things about me that I know probably should change, but Jesus, could we, could we work out a deal where I'll follow you to this point and you'll give me enough leash here to just, you know, live this part of my life the way I want to. We were really young in ministry. And um, so Jenny and I were in Baltimore and we were um, planting a church. And <laughs> we were hungry for every person who would come in the door. I mean, man, if they came in the door, we left, you know, just leaped on them and that was, you know, here's, here's somebody new. And on this particular Sunday morning, a couple from our congregation, they brought their daughter-in-law to church. Now, in our church in Baltimore, we had an altar rail across the front, and I would preach, and then most Sundays I would give an invitation to come forward. Some of you will remember that as part of your own church tradition. I'd give an invitation to come forward. If you want to receive Christ this morning or have a prayer burden, come and kneel at the altar, and we'll come and, and pray with you. And the agreement was that, that I would pray with the men who would come and some of the leaders would pray with the men. If women came, then our wives would join us. And so this couple's daughter-in-law came and she knelt at the altar rail and Jenny was, was the pianist and uh, she got up from the piano bench, she came over, we knelt with her. It's amazing how this happened 36 years ago and it's like it happened yesterday. We... We dealt with her, that's an old term of saying, we prayed with her, we cared for her, we talked with her about the gospel. And she understood it completely. And she looked us in the eye and she said, if I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord, do I need to give up this, this, and this? And we said, yes. And she said, I don't think I'm ready to do that. And so we said to her, hey, can we come to your house this week and talk to you more? It'll be more comfortable. We can do that at your house. Sure, let's do that. So we went to her house. We sat at her dining room table. I remember it. She sat here. I sat here. Jenny sat here. I remember it. And I remember we opened the scriptures and we talked with her about who Jesus is and what he would do in her life. And she said, I've been thinking about this. If Jesus is willing to let me continue to live this way and this way in this part of my life, then I'm willing to trust him with this part of my life. But she said, I don't think that that's what the Bible teaches. She said, I read some of the things that you gave me, and she said, it seems like I need to confess my sin, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and give him everything that I know I have in that moment and say, I will follow you. And we said, yeah, that's what the Bible says. He said, I can't do that. Maybe someday when I'm older, maybe someday when I've lived enough of life and enjoyed all these things, maybe then, but I can't do that. Broke our hearts. Broke our hearts. Because here's what I know to be true. That if you will surrender to Jesus your life, if you will confess to him that you're a sinner and confess that he is the Savior, the only one, confess that he is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, he will change your life. And you will never look back you will never regret the decision. He will, in the moment of time that you confess, take away your sin. He will declare you righteous 
by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He will send his Holy Spirit to live in you and change you from the inside out. In that very moment, he will adopt you into God's family. He will make you part of the church of Jesus Christ. He will give you the assurance that when you die, you will go to live with Jesus forever in heaven. You will never have to worry about that truth again. And your life will be transformed by his life. Does it mean that you will never have problems? No. It means that you will walk through every valley and every mountaintop with the very God who created you, who sustains you, who loves you more than anyone else could possibly love you. And you don't want to walk through that in life alone. You want him by your side, in your heart, guiding and directing you in every step. If you know that's true, can you say amen? Because that's who he is. So I want to ask you today, have you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? Because he is the I am. He is God. There is no other. Even if you shop around, you'll find nowhere else and no one else who will make the promise and fulfill the promise of forgiving your sin, changing your life, and giving you the absolute assurance of eternal life in heaven. His name is Jesus, and he is God. Would you pray with me? It is amazing, Lord, that even as you spoke in John 8, many put their faith in you. That's what you tell us in your word. Many put their faith in you. Lord, I pray that today every person in this sanctuary and every person online would have that as a testimony that they have put their faith in you. I pray that not one person would try to fit you into the mold of the God they want, but they would be willing to surrender to you and allow you to remake them into the man or woman you want them to be. This morning, with heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to ask you, have you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and are you saved? Do you know with confidence today that your sins are forgiven and you have a new life in Christ? There is no one who can change you as he is able to. Are you ready to allow him to transform you from the inside out? As you sit here this morning, if it's your desire to believe in and surrender your life to Jesus Christ, then I invite you to pray where you're seated in the silence of your heart with absolute sincerity this prayer of salvation. Jesus, I believe that you are who you say you are. That you are the I am. I believe that you are God. I believe that there is no other God but you. There is no other way of salvation but you. Jesus, I confess you today as Lord. And I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. I confess my sin to you. I know that I've sinned against you in my life. Please take away the sin, the guilt, the shame. Please transform me and give me a new life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your gift of salvation. Thank you for your great love for me. Thank you for hearing my prayer for saving my life and for changing me by the Holy Spirit's power. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Lord, I thank you that the promise of your word is that you hear and answer those prayers. And we know immediately because your spirit witnesses to our spirit that we're children of God. Move and work mightily here this morning. And to our congregation online. Lord, I pray that you would also cause these words of John 8, the hearts and the minds of every believer here, to drive us to a place of absolute gratitude that you are the I am and there is no other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand with me. Let's declare Jesus as the great I am.